All right, well, first let me applaud for CE and all the great work that's going on. And thank you for inviting me to talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing in COVID at Odyssey. I'm uh, George Ripsack, uh, Director of the Odyssey Coordinating Center at Columbia. Uh, that's short for Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics, the mission to improve health by empowering a community to generate evidence. Over 2,000 collaborators from 74 countries and the distributed database has over 810 million unique patients at this point. So we're over 10% of the world's population in our database. The way it works is similar. Um, it's a distributed database. We use our packages distributed view at GitHub or some auto automated methods. Um, the studies are distributed, they're sent back, and then we collaboratively interpret them and generate the papers and interpret the evidence. The orange shown in the right on the upper uh, right over here, Odyssey is not so much a data network or a data model, but a, 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 an initiative in reliable evidence, how to make it so that people begin to trust observational data. And that's where a lot of our time goes into. For COVID, as you can imagine, we've been working hard on it. I won't go through the timeline. As of September, we had about 41 papers published in different areas, and I'll, I'll kind of go through some of them here. It started, just so happens, the symposium was supposed to happen in March, 2020. So we uh, instead held a virtual study-a-thon, 88 hours straight, you slept when you could, it's an international effort, so it went around the clock. And that got us started. Our first thing was really characterizing the disease. Remember, we weren't so sure about it early on. Ended up in Nature Communications, the deep phenotyping. And I'll just, in the interest of time, go straight here. One of the figures, you know, the, in the news, it was a lot about, well, don't worry because it's only older, sicker people. But in fact, if you compared to the flu, it was hitting younger people. And that was really the main point of that paper. Uh, and then since then done characterization kind of across the board, you know, asthma, pregnancy, cancer, liver disease, kidney disease, rheumatologic disease, autoimmune disease, and so on. And generally the way we work, it goes quickly on Med Archive. And it goes immediately on the internet. So if you have a question about COVID in the context of some disease, data.odyssey.org may already have a worldwide analysis of that. And then later gets published as a paper. But you know, papers are interesting. But I, what I'd like to do is focus on some things that influence on policy decisions. So I'll go there next. If you remember, we were once using hydroxychloroquine. And uh, the, the FDA doesn't tell you necessarily, they make decisions, but you don't get detail on how they made the decisions. The European Medicines Agency or EMA gives you more detailed uh, history of it. And so hydroxychloroquine is a very safe drug, but when you give it to 200 million people prophylactic, prophylactically, it becomes less safe, especially in combination with azithromycin. So our study was one of the two studies that the EMA used in their revocation of um, the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine in the setting of COVID. Another example, hypertension drugs, drugs ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and um, it was wondered whether they would make you more susceptible to COVID or more severe COVID. And we were one of several studies published. But what I like is you see the red hour on the right there, the Morales study, that's the Odyssey study, being highlighted for being a reproducible observational study by the EMA. And then that was our target to try to be seen in that way. That was published in Lancet Digital Health. And then a series of studies after that, Scylla is, sorry for the acronyms, uh, is our uh, comparative effectiveness series and Caribdis being our characterization series. Um, and then doing some fun papers. This paper in BMJ was just looking at the, what would people treated with around the world for COVID and how is it influenced or at least temporarily associated with studies that came out, not just Odyssey studies, but everybody's studies. <clears throat> Uh, also looking at predictive models, we did um, co co cover was the name of ours. It ended up being adopted for policy in Catalonia. Uh, the big thing about that was the broad worldwide verification. You know, we looked at other systems like C19, but they had a AUC of about 0.5 or coin flipping when you move them around the world. So that was, but still the predictive value was only 0.8 uh, or something for ours. And then this is our early work in past looking at long COVID versus long influenza and what was different about long COVID. So that was this study. And now actually just an hour ago, they were presenting the current work at Odyssey at our uh, uh, community meeting. We've, I've spent a lot of my time on vaccine safety and effectiveness recently. We have a, a convener grant, $10 million from the FDA 
uh, Center for Biologics Evaluation Research on their BEST initiative, looking at vaccine safety and effectiveness, and, and also our network studies to coordinate them. And we're also partnered with the European Medicines Agency. And we've been commenting on the protocols as they come out of the FDA to give feedback so they can come out with the best protocols possible. And then they commissioned a study, a data study on the sensitivity of background rates. So as reports come in of something going wrong, whether it's myocarditis or clotting, you compare that to something. And how are those background rates sensitive to your design? And that was our first study we did for FDA. There's a number of things you would guess, age, health seeking behavior. Anchoring is one that's not talked about that turned out to be very important. In your control group who didn't get the vaccine, what were they doing when they didn't get that vaccine? Were they random date, healthcare visit, a healthy healthcare visit, or what? Our results shown here, um, one thing is that anchoring turned out to be very important. And so you have to be careful what you compare to. Also that these decisions can change the incidence rate by a thousand fold. So you have to be very careful how you correct for it. Then we took what we learned here and then actually calculated background rates. Now, if you remember in March, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine was shut off in 13 countries due to coagulation to clotting uh, concerns. And on March 18th, EMA came to a determination that it was worth the benefit, that there was some rare clotting, but the common clotting wasn't happening, and therefore it was worth the risk due to the improvement in your COVID profile. So the evidence that they used was actually the Odyssey background rate study. And in fact, it hadn't been published yet. So they actually even gave us a letter. I've never gotten this before, a letter from, from the EMA that said, dear editor, please work on this as quickly as possible. We want peer review for these data. But they had already put forward the termination. The paper came out in April. Uh, then a lot of work on method studies, comparison of vaccine safety methods shown here, case control cohort, historical comparator. Self-controlled designs seem to do best, but they all do terrible due to um, stand, uh, standard error, um, systematic errors. So type one error outweighs everything else. We address that through calibration. And then finally, uh, just looking at vaccine effectiveness, first looking at uh, Columbia and then uh, spreading across the network. So we have the state and citywide vaccination records. So we know who wasn't vaccinated. The CDC used our data in their uh, NL New England Journal of Medicine paper. So we want to complement that, not duplicate it. So we did a cohort study looking at biases week by week. And as mentioned earlier, I think it was Jeff, that uh, chart review ended up being very important to complement the uh, structured data. And the things we found are like anchoring matters a lot. And in fact, COVID is very different from influenza vaccine. Influenza vaccine is like a healthcare visit. COVID vaccination, because you're getting it you know, at work or, or other places, is more like a random date. High false positive rate also reported earlier during this session. Um, and a lot of week one, in the first week after your vaccine, a lot of biases. Mild COVID doesn't come in because it's ascribed to vaccination. What we're mostly finding in the first week is in incidental COVID um, it, when they came in for other problems, just as again reported earlier. When we correct for all those things, we get a quite an accurate match to the randomized trial results. So shown in the upper right, you see the week by week analysis for diagnosis and for hospitalization that is severe disease. The first week being way off, its effectiveness should be zero and it's high up. But as you get to the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth weeks, pretty much mirroring what we're finding in the studies. And on the bottom right, showing the uh, for each vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, Janssen, that are corrected uh, observational studies uh, very well match the RCT results that we get. Also finding in our head-to-head -head comparisons that we're not seeing a big difference between Pfizer and Moderna, despite the comparisons between two separate studies, when you do them in one study, same population, we're getting similar results, but that's still we're working on. So anyway, it's been a wild ride for everyone involved in informatics and epidemiology. And again, I wanna congratulate you on your work.